Hey everyone, Mitch coming in for the Commander's Core Studio. Welcome to the show, and welcome to what I'm calling at this point, uh, Commander's Quarters Uncut. Uh, we'll see if that name sticks or not. It's just what I have for now, but basically an episode where I just turn on the camera and just start talking about whatever topic, uh, you know, there is of that day or that week, essentially, that just happens to pop up in my mind, or, you know, if there's, you know, recent news like there was the other day about, you know, Hasbro and their stock and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, uh, on this episode, um, there, there, there's this question that always keeps coming back again and again and again throughout the years. You know, uh, Mitch, what kind of decks do you enjoy playing? Uh, what personal decks do you have? Uh, and it kind of cropped up again recently. So yeah, I just decided to do an episode on uh, my personal favorite decks right now that I'm playing, the ones I'm focusing most on now. And, and yeah, I do try to keep my collection of decks down to, you know, a, a reasonable amount that I can actually manage and I, and I can actually update when I feel like updating them. Uh, and yeah, just not expanding out too <laughs> too wide with my deck collection because I like to make sure that I'm actually getting a good enough play, uh, a good enough amount of play out of them, you know, going to an LGS or to some friends' houses and just, yeah, not uh, just, you know, having, you know, 30 decks and just, you know, ignoring certain ones, but being able to, you know, just have a good wide variety of decks. Uh, I think nine, at least for myself, is a good number uh, where I can kind of go to any level of power that I really need to go to for the most part and then also have different styles of play too. So, yeah, with all that said, uh, let's just jump into those decks. I'm just going to start things off with one of the ones I've been pulling a, a lot lately, uh, and I really do enjoy it a lot. That'd be Joda Archmage Eternal. Now, I've actually had a previous Joda deck uh, that I used to own a long, long time ago. I think it was like the second or third episode on this channel, actually, on a Joda deck. I think that one with Doomsday, actually, uh, or that was kind of like the end goal of it. Or was that jo or was that Golos? I, I can't remember. I think that was Golos. Never mind. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> the initial Jota deck uh, definitely had a different focus than this one does because this one actually focuses on one of my favorite cards of all time in Magic, and that is Villainous Wealth. Villainous Wealth, uh, for those who don't know, target opponent exiles the top X cards of their library. May cast a number of non-land cards with converted mana costs. Extra less among them without paying their mana costs. Basically, hey... Just get a bunch of fun stuff off the top of an opponent's library. Now, as fun as that is, I wanted to kind of hyper-focus on that and make it even more fun, at least for myself. So, basically, my goal is, yes, to ramp a ton and to put a ton of mana into that X value. But not just that, because, I mean, I think you can be a little more efficient if you actually go about copying it as well. So, I'm going to be utilizing a lot of copy cards. And I'm not even talking about, you know, it's like 10 or so. I think at this point, I've got like 20 or so in the deck. And every single time a new one gets reprinted, I think, I mean, I think Reverberate just got reprinted. It's finally budget again, but yeah, uh, Reverberate, I think it's Red Red. I mean, one of those just got reprinted and it's finally budget again, but yeah, I'm running a ton of them, like all Vedic iteration. Whenever you cast your next insert source spell this turn, copy that spell, make two targets for the copy. Now, if you've got copy spells that I can actually, uh, you know, copy any spell, including your opponents, then it actually kind of works as like counter spell backup in a way. But also, you know, by copying Villainous Wealth and utilizing some of that mana instead of going into that X, you can then, you know, split up that Villainous Wealth to then go after another opponent. Or again, if opponents are ready with counter spells, well, if you've copied it a couple times, uh, you're going to at least hopefully get a couple of copies of your Villainous Wealth through. So yeah, that can be just a, a big fun play. Uh, in any deck that can run threefold signal, <laughs> uh, I'm sure I'm gonna put it on the screen too, but yeah, this card's just ridiculous just because this is a, a traffic light in Magic, which when I first saw this, I'm like, my goodness, what kind of a deck would ever use this? Uh, turns out uh, this is perfect for my Jota deck with Villainous Wealth. Enters the battlefield, scry three, that's nice. More importantly, each spell you cast that's exactly three colors has replicate three. So by paying three extra, you can copy Villainous Wealth. And of course, you can do that more than once. So yeah, Joda, the entire goal of the deck is literally just cast and copy Villainous Wealth for as much as you can. I think my record at this point, um, six Villainous Wealths, uh, X equals nine. So that was a lot of fun, uh, <laughs> at least for myself. I think others enjoyed seeing kind of the, the big massive play too as well. But yeah, I do, I do give my opponents a heads up kind of on what the deck is all about beforehand and make sure that that one is okay though. Uh, because I know some players out there aren't, you know, okay with their cards necessarily getting stolen. Uh, I mean, off the top library of Villainous Wealth, not just, you know, stealing effects, you know, necessarily, but still. So I, I make sure that I actually make others aware of that before starting to play if they haven't played against it before. Uh, speaking of making players aware of a game plan of a deck, uh, yeah, Cody is actually one of my favorites recently too. And actually, I, I do technically have my other older Cody deck still uh, somewhere. I do not bring that one with me nearly as much though. Uh, and again, I try to keep it to, you know, the nine decks uh, as much as I can. 
but yeah, so this Cody deck, well, let me first read Cody. Um, can't cast permanent spells, pay four tap, add Wooburg. Basically when you cast your next spell of uh, this turn, you exile card until you hit something that costs less, insert sorcery. You cast that uh, for free essentially, and each other card goes on the bottom of your library in random order. Uh, essentially, Cody can be built in a bunch of different ways. The way that I like to build it, though, the way that I have built it in the past is like trying to go around one specific card. My previous Cody deck was Neville Betrayal. This one is actually Hyper Genesis. And yes, I definitely warn my opponents beforehand and say like, hey, is everyone okay with this kind of a deck? Because if not, I definitely will not play it. If they are, we're going to have a fun time. <laughs> so Hyper Genesis, a sorcery that doesn't have a cost. So basically for Cody's sake, you know, when you're hitting off the top, it is zero. Um, starting with you, each player may put an artifact, creature, enchantment, or land card from their hand on the battlefield. Repeats this process until no one puts a card on the battlefield. Basically, it's blue braids, kind of, in a way, but all at once. So everyone just dumps their hand, you know, all permanent cards, essentially, except, I believe, Planeswalkers, into play kind of one at a time. And so, yeah, you can just basically just dump a bunch of things into play. And uh, you're going to be a little more prepared than your opponents are, though, with this Cody deck, because... You're going to be running a lot of massive things that have some massive ETBs, so you can get a lot of value out of them right away. Or you can kind of take apart your opponent's value that they might be getting, again, from Hypergenesis. Now, the way Hypergenesis works, and rules lawyers out there, please correct me because I'm probably not going to say this correctly, but basically, all the ETBs kind of happen at once. So, like, you just drop everything, you know, from your hand. Hypergenesis doesn't resolve until everything is dropped into play. No ETBs happen until the end of it after it's gone. And then, yeah, then all those ETBs happen. So you get to see everything your opponent's dumped into play. So yeah, Terastodon is fantastic in this kind of a deck because it's a 9-9, which is great to cheat into play. Also enters battlefield, you can destroy up to three target non-creature permanents. For each permanent, put a grave of this way. It's control gets a 3-3 elephant. Basically, hey, um, sure, you just got your massive creatures out. Now, or actually, not massive creatures, because this one can't take out creatures, though there are plenty of things that can take out creatures, like Luminate Primordial. Anyways, you got, you know, some massive enchantments or artifacts into play. Cool, let's take those out. Here's some elephants instead. Um... Now, the way that I ensure, and I probably should mention this earlier, that I always hit Hypergenesis when I want to, is with uh, cards that obviously have a mana value of, well, actually, three or less. Because what I like to call this deck, it's a 3-0 strategy. So, basically, anytime I cast Insert Sorcery with Cody, and that costs three or less, I am guaranteed to hit Hypergenesis, because there are absolutely no other cards in the deck that that can hit. There are no other cards in the deck that cost three or less that are instant sorceries. So um, really good cards in this deck are gonna be your split cards like Bound and Determined. Determined is fantastic with Cody. Uh, instant for uh, green, blue. Other spells you control can't be countered by spells or abilities this turn, draw a card. So yeah, your Hypergenesis is not gonna be able to get countered, which is great, and you're gonna be able to hit it off the top. The other side is Bound. You can sacrifice a creature from up to X cards in your graveyard to your hand wrecks the number of colors uh, that creature was, then remove this card from the game. This card does have a mana value of three uh, black green, so that is five. And this side can actually hit our three mana value spells, which there are, I believe, two of them. Witness the Future is one. But yeah, basically spells that can shuffle back Hypergenesis into the deck so you can do it again. So yeah, essentially these uh, you know split cards are fantastic because their total mana value when Cody is you know going through your deck to see what's on top, essentially, is the combined total, so you're never going to hit them, essentially. So yeah, this costs seven. Great, you're not going to hit it, but you can utilize the two, you can utilize the five to get both pieces of this strategy. So yeah, that's Cody. And again, that is another deck that I definitely... Uh, make players aware of what it's going to be doing and ask ahead of time. Speaking of which, I've actually only played this deck once. I still have it currently uh, put together. Uh, but yeah, um, uh, the Prismatic Bridge uh, is a commander that I've built around a, a couple of times now. One with Deep Glow Skate essentially as the focus. This one with another creature as the focus. Uh, Prismatic Bridge, uh, the, the front side desk, but the side I use is Prismatic Bridge. Legendary Enchantment. If you ever keep real cards to top your library to really creature Planeswalker basically put on the battlefield essentially so yeah with this deck and with this build i only have one creature in the deck so there's only one possible thing this can hit and the entire deck is built around and i kind of didn't realize exactly how potent this strategy would be because obviously with the presenting bridge uh, that's an upkeep trigger when you hit it so you've got all your mana available to you uh and then ink trader nephilim uh is going to be that creature that you're going to hit every single time so this comes into play and your opponents are going to be in big trouble whenever a player plays in so sorcery spell if ink turn nephilim is the only target of that spell copy it for each other creature that spell could target uh each copy targets it from those creatures basically hey uh, for as many creatures on the board you're copying whatever spell you're casting that is targeting just ink treader plus your opponents things as well but you're going to build this entire deck around this obviously so yeah a simple expedite uh which is just you know instant for a red mana target creature gains haste in the left turn that's nice draw a card so yeah, you're paying one mana essentially, and let's say that there are 20 creatures in play because it's counting your opponent's creatures as well. One mana, draw 20. 
yeah uh ancestral recall eat your heart out uh so yeah there's a lot of powerful things you can do and actually with all the treasure cards that have been printed lately there are certain treasure cards that actually target so yeah being able to just target a creature that target creature gets plus two plus zero until the turn create a treasure the plus two plus zero doesn't really matter all that much it kind of does a little bit you know in certain circumstances but the most important part is making a treasure for every single creature on the board essentially so yeah you can easily get an absurd amount of mana in one turn draw your entire deck essentially uh, I mean, yeah, Trader Screed is another fun card with this one. Sorcery, it says, gain control target creature until end of turn. Untap that creature, gain taste until end of turn. Add two mana of any one color, or any color. Um, yeah, that is basically um, Insurrection, uh, plus a ton of mana. Because you are targeting a Trader, you target all the creatures on the board, you gain control of every single creature on the board, and you also get, you know, two mana per each creature. So, yeah, I mean, you, de you definitely win from there. <laughs> and again, I, I didn't realize exactly how potent this was going to be, especially since, again... You've got all your mana up essentially when you get Ink Treader out, and you've got plenty of ways to protect Prismatic Bridge as well too. Uh, and yeah, just protect your team, protect everyone's creatures. Essentially, make even more creatures. Essentially, the turn that Ink Treader comes down, you win. The vast majority of the time, you win. It's going to be very hard for your opponents to stop you. So yeah, I, I put this one together, and um, I've only played it once. Uh, and, and now this is going to be one of those decks again where I definitely have to warn people ahead of time, and it's only going to be use essentially uh, you know at the the highest level of power that i actually play with friends essentially it's not going to be used in any other circumstance and, and it's again one that you know i might have to take apart one day because there's just not enough times i'm playing it but it is uh it's definitely more potent than i thought it would be let's just say that uh next up for a completely different kind of a deck one that really surprised me that i very much enjoy is mr orfeo the boulder a uh, very simple commander whenever you attack double target creatures power until i have turn yeah, uh, just getting, you know, big, dumb creatures in play, uh, like, you know, Beast of Burden. Uh, again, kind of like Ink Trader, you know, caring about the number of creatures on the board, kind of. Uh, it's power and toughness to each equal to the number of creatures in play. So this thing can become quite massive, especially, again, in a game of Commander. For six mana, you might get a 20-20, <laughs> because, again, your opponents might have a lot of creatures on the board. So cool. You've got a 20-20, and when it attacks, you know, you double, or whenever any creature attacks, you can double its power. So then, yeah, that, that can hit for 40 if you really want to. Of course, there are ways to give Trample. Uh, but the actual focus of the deck really is more so like fling effects. So being able to sacrifice a giant creature that you just doubled its power to hit someone out of nowhere for a ton of damage. Uh, fling's obviously great, but you lose the creature. Gravetic Punch is fantastic, though. You don't lose the creature, and you can uh, jumpstart to cast it again. Target creature control deals damage equal to its power to target creature. So yeah, that's a great card in the deck, obviously. You're just like, hey, this uh, creature now is you know 20 power or whatnot. I'm going to hit you for 20. Jumpstart, do it again. You can really take opponents out, out of nowhere. You know, they can be at full health, essentially, you know, 40 life, and you can easily take them out of the deck like this. It just, it's been surprisingly powerful. Uh, but it, I mean, I wouldn't say overpowered it anyways. It definitely takes a while to get going and it can be stopped, obviously, but it, it can definitely kind of swing above its, you know, uh, it can punch up a little bit sometimes if players aren't expecting it. And then you can do some pretty fun things to like, you know, train uh, Tanuki, Transplanter. Uh, you can also utilize power in other ways, like, you know, getting a ton of mana out of this. Uh, whenever it or a quick creature attacks, add an amount of green equal to its power. Until I turn, you don't lose mana, steps and phases end. So yeah, you can utilize power in different ways, like getting a ton of mana out of something like this, or drawing a ton of cards with other cards, like uh, Disciple of Bolas or something like that, I believe. But yeah, I, I can't go through all the cards. And I probably should have mentioned that. I'm just going to be highlighting a couple cards for each commander, and I didn't, don't think I mentioned that. That's why these uncut episodes are the way they are. I just end up flatbergging on it, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> some of you seem to enjoy them. But yeah, Mr. Ruffio has definitely been one that has surprised me over time. And just, yeah, I, I always seem to, you know, if I'm trying to play a more or more casual game where I'm not trying to, you know, do something crazy off the wall, I'm just, you know, okay, I'll just, you know, get big creatures. I'll swing with them. I'll fling them, you know, that kind of stuff. So yeah, I've definitely been enjoying that one. Uh, speaking of utilizing creatures, though, and yet another uh, commander that I definitely, uh, you know, get some uh, feedback from uh, my opponents first, you know, if they're okay with, again, theft kind of effects. Or actually, this is more so threaten effects in a way. But Hoffrey, Ghostforge, another recent favorite of mine. And it's just an interesting commander. Spirit you control, get plus almost one and have trample and haste. Whenever another non tone creature you control dies, exile it. If you do create a token that's copy of that creature, except the spirit initiative other types. And it has when this creature leaves the battlefield, return the exile card to your graveyard. Um, uh, I mean, I believe actually they changed, they routed that. It's you know, whatever you know, owner's graveyard is. Regardless, um, yeah, so with Hoffrey, you can, of course, take advantage of your own creature's ETBs, because when they die, you essentially get a token that comes back. The way that I like to build around, though, is taking advantage of my opponent's creatures themselves. So again, utilizing a bunch of threatened effects, like, you know, Act of Treason, just a very simple spell. Gain control of target creature until end of turn, untap that creature, gains haste until end of turn. So first up, you can obviously utilize that creature in combat, which is great. You just say, hey, that's the best creature on the board that my opponents have. I'll take that. I'll swing with it. I'll get whatever value out of it that I want to get out of it. 
And then, yeah, you know what? Instead of actually giving it back to that opponent, I'm actually going to kind of utilize that threaten effect as a removal and kind of like clone spell in the same way, because I can utilize a sacrifice salad, especially a fantastic free one like Goblin Bombardment. Sacrifice a creature, Goblin Bombardment deals one damage to any target. So I can ping something for one, which is great, but I also get to sacrifice that creature that I gain control of. It's going away, again, thanks to Hoffrey. It's basically, you know, getting replaced with a spirit token version of it. So if it had any kind of ETBs or LTBs, I get those, obviously. But yeah, I basically just kind of, instead of temporarily gaining control of Bones Creature, I kind of permanently did until that spirit token goes away. And also, you know, I got whatever value out of it already. So it's kind of like a removal spell and also a clone spell all in one with this commander, which I absolutely love. Again, there are, of course, really cool ways that you can take advantage of ETBs. One of my favorites in this deck is uh, Goblin Dark Dwellers. When it enters the battlefield, you may cast target instant resource card to convert a mana cost three or less from your grave without paying its mana cost. The card put a grave of this turn exile instead. Basically, it's a, a great ETB because a lot of those threatened effects, again, like active treason or threaten itself, are, you know, three or less mana. So, you know, threaten a creature, you know, utilize Goblin Dark Dwellers to do it again. And then, yeah, if, once you need to do that again, you can sacrifice the Dark Dwellers, get that spirit token copy version of it thanks to Hoffrey, get that ETB again, threaten again. There's a lot of cool combinations that you can do this commander. And yeah, again, this is one that I do. Uh, again, I, I like to make sure that everyone's on the same page with decks like these, especially again, when there are certain types of strategies that not everyone's on board for. If someone doesn't want to play against Hoffrey, cool, I'll play a different one of my decks. So uh, one of those decks uh, that I really have been enjoying lately, I'm enjoying for quite some time now, is my Gigantha deck, uh, or should, should I say uh, Gigantha Karuga deck, uh, both companions, obviously, but only Karuga is the companion for this one. Uh, Gigantha, I tried to actually just pick kind of like in unassuming, um, a kind of like less threatening, I would I would say, five color commander, but one that still has some some utility in the deck. Um, so Gigantha is just a five five elemental elk for four and a gruel, and basically you can tap for Wooberg, Wooberg, but you can only spend uh, that on um, non generic costs essentially. So that does help you actually cast the companion and a lot of other things in this deck as well. Karuga is the companion. Uh, so basically, in my starting deck, it can only have converted mana cost three or greater for everything and also lands, which does help slow down kind of the, the deck essentially to a point where other players, again, you might start off behind others, but you can definitely catch up and get to a point where you can definitely get ahead of them. And also, you might not be seeing, uh, seen as that much of a threat early. Um, and yeah, Karuga is great in this deck. Enters the battlefield, draw a card for each other permanent you control with converted mana cost three or greater. Uh, this deck also likes to utilize some really cool ETBs uh, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, you're going to want to utilize a bunch of big creatures. Ashen Rider is one of my favorites. Enters the battlefield or dies, exile target permanent. That is a huge effect. And so the entire goal of this deck, and I probably should mention this earlier, is basically to get multiple copies of creatures out uh, and just be able to keep getting more and more copies of them. So of course there are copy spells and great token versions of creatures, as well as a, a card like Seance. And I absolutely love when decks can utilize just off the wall cards that are like kind of seen as useless. And actually every time I play Seance, it kind of gets made fun of for just being a bad card. And it very much is in a lot of ways, but in this deck it can really shine. And I love those kinds of cards. Seance says, at the beginning of each up, keep your Magsal target creature card from your graveyard. If you do, put a token on the battlefield that's a copy of that card, except it's a spirit of other types. Exile at the beginning, next end step. So basically, and keep in mind, that do not say haste anywhere on there. Your creature that you exile and get a token copy of does not get haste. So yeah, just overall, it's kind of a really bad card again in a lot of situations. And again, you don't get to keep that creature. But with this deck, you're going to be utilizing again, a bunch of creatures that have a lot of ETBs that are fantastic. So even just, you know, maybe if, if crew gets taken out, being able to, you know, exile and get another copy of it so you can get that ETB again to draw a lot of cards, that can be huge. Again, you're getting that for free every single turn, getting a Seance trigger. And obviously, you only take advantage of those creatures once, but you can actually take advantage of them more if you've got something like Song of the World Soul, which is one of my favorite cards in Magic ever. Uh, whenever you cast a spell, Populate. Populated means create tokens, copy of a creature token you control. So again, the goal of this deck is just, hey, get creatures out that have some great ETBs, get copies of them, and then populate them, get more token copies of them. That's really the goal of the deck is just say, okay, yeah, I've got a bunch of Ashen Riders in play. I'm going to get rid of a lot of things. Uh, and if you take them out to you, they're going to get rid of even more things. One of my favorite ways to try to finish players off those with like Gary, Great Merchant of Asphodel, getting a token copy of that. And then, yeah, just populating it again and again and again, getting more and more devotion in play and draining my opponents quickly while also, you know, getting a bunch of life. So, yeah, I very much have enjoyed Gigantha Karuga. And, yeah, I, that is the deck uh, that you might have seen that I actually I made a bunch of uh, obnoxious tokens uh, for every single one of the uh, 
regular creatures in the deck. So I, I drew like two Ashen Riders, just, uh, but I believe it was like Ashen Pokemon that I, <laughs> I drew that one up. But yeah, I have some really weird tokens for that one. So I very much enjoy uh, pulling all those tokens as well. Uh, next up, another deck that you might have seen on Close Quarters, actually. Um, Garth One Eye. I, I very much enjoy this commander and, and kind of I like how this deck this deck evolved because the initial concept for the deck was okay. Well, let's just start with Garth. Tap choose a card that name that has been chosen uh, from among Disenchant, Brain Geyser, Terror, Shivan Dragon, Regrowth, and Black Lotus. Create a copy of the card chosen name. You may cast the copy. So Garth obviously has a fantastic tap effect that is like kind of like a Swiss Army knife. It gets you a card from Alpha essentially that you can use. And again, depending on the situation, you know, maybe you need to take out a creature. Terror is going to be great. You know, uh, Disenchant, cool. You get rid of an artifact or enchantment. Black Lotus, who doesn't want free extra mana? Brain Geyser, draw a bunch of cards. Regrowth, get something back. Shivan Dragon, sure, make a dragon. Why not? But yeah, so. Being able to utilize untap effects, and that was kind of the initial thought for the deck. I just want to be able to untap Garth. I want other things that care about untapping. I want just reasons to untap things. And so then I actually around that too, Miss Vault Bridge uh, and all those bridge I, I, bridges, I believe actually came on the same set. I mean, they the same set symbol, I believe was kind of around how this kind of thought process went too. Uh, enters the battlefield tapped is indestructible taps for blue or black the most important part on this is that it's indestructible and there's a cycle of 10 in total uh plus i mean there's another budget you know um indestructible land out there dark steel citadel as well but yeah so utilizing indestructible lands uh which uh, which um can help you utilize you know those uh fertile ground type cards like market festival uh, being kind of a bigger one but yeah market festival when it enchant land is tapped for mana it's sort of it's two mana and any combination of colors to their mana pool basically making this indestructible land tap for a ton of mana just getting more and more and more of these auras on it because again it's somewhat protected being an indestructible land there's not a lot of things you know, that players typically run in commander that can deal with indestructible lands and so being able to utilize that mana really effectively and of course again with cards like you know unbender time again a card that doesn't see a lot of play in a lot of decks out there but i just love when you can utilize these cards that are kind of off the wall and different uh tap on tap another target permanent so this can obviously untap garth untap other you know permits that we have that can be very effective and of course untap our lands most importantly again those indestructible lands that we can make tap for an absurd amount of mana you can just have some really absurd turns with this one uh, and yeah, this one can definitely just, it can, can really do some pretty crazy things. Um, I do mention now that actually I have updated the deck a couple of times. It does utilize cards, I believe like Wake Root Elemental and uh, Filigree, Filigree Sages are in there as well right now, uh, which can, can definitely go infinite uh, with a land that's tapping for a decent amount of mana. Uh, so that is something else I do mention have time, making sure that players are okay with the game ending with an infinite combo. If they're not, I can either take those cards out or I can just play a different deck. Uh, one deck that stayed with me uh, for a long time now and that I very much enjoy though is Feldegriff. Uh, Feldegriff is just a derpy commander. <laughs> it is something that is definitely kind of never intended, obviously. I mean, it was made before commander, but yeah, it's it's a card that really just when you see it, you're like, how in the world would that be a commander? Uh, let's just read it real quick. Uh, pay a white flying until end of turn, target opponent gains two life. Pay a blue, return Feldegriff to its owner's hand, target opponent may draw a card. Pay a green, trample until end of turn, put a hippo token in a planner, target opponent control, to create that, or sorry, treat this token as a 1 1 green creature. It just helps all other players essentially. I mean, cool. You can give your 4 4 hippo, um, a or 4 4 Feldegriff, uh, you know, flying, uh, you can bounce back to your hand or you can give it trample. But every single one of those things that you do is going to benefit an opponent. Uh, but with that, I, I just absolutely love Feldegriff. Um, so, Players do build a group hug. I prefer to build it and call it political control because I am still trying to win. I am still trying to actually win the game, even though, you know, I'm going to make alliances. I'm going to help players out. I'm going to say, okay, yeah, you need to gain a little bit of life right now to pad your life toll because you're almost getting taken out. I'll save you. You owe me a favor. Or, you know, I've been the, uh, you know, the bounce is great just to save Valdegriff. And, you know, you can make a deal with an opponent. Hey, I'll give you the card to draw, you know, if you do this. Uh, but most importantly, that last one, being able to give Felder of Trample, who cares? But being able to make Hippo Tokens, and this is actually the only one that's, I believe, not a May. The opponent has no choice if they get a Hippo Token or not, which is huge. Because being able to just force opponents to take Hippo Tokens can really help you out throughout the game. Uh, and, and yeah, again, you can make alliances. You can say, okay, I'll give you Hippos this time. That other player doesn't get any Hippos. You get Hippos, so what are you going to do with them? Yeah, you can also make deals like, okay, make sure you attack that other player with these hippos that I'm giving you, okay? Uh, Palliation Accord, again, a card that sees absolutely no play anywhere because it's just a very, very strange, very, very old card. Uh, whenever a creature uh, an opponent controls comes tapped, put a, it was shield counter. I believe they updated it, unfortunately, because now shield counters are a thing. 
I don't think they had to because Palliation Court is not overpowered. But this is a completely different topic for a different day. Uh, but I believe it's now a Palliation uh, counter on Palliation Accord. Remove one of those counters from it. Prevent the next one damage we dealt to you this turn. So basically, it's just one of the many ways in this deck to ensure that we're not getting hit by our own hippos. Because uh, opponents, sure, you can attack us with uh, attacking with the hippos. But uh, yeah, I'll just get those counters on this. I'll be able to remove them, prevent the damage. And yeah, when creatures are swinging elsewhere, um, yeah, I can essentially get counters on them as well. So when those hippos are going elsewhere, great. Especially when they're going elsewhere, and again, when you're making these deals, but okay, I'll give you eight hippos. Again, this deck likes to ramp first and then just give a bunch of hippos out. I'll give you eight hippos on the condition that you swing with them at that player that we both don't like next turn. Cool, they do that. Some of those hippos survive. Maybe they swing with some other creatures too. Cast something like Theft of Dreams. I love this card. And I love other kind of old, again, cards like this that are just kind of forgotten in a way and also really don't work in a lot of situations but with this deck it's pretty perfect for each tab creature target opponent controls draw a card this can draw an absurd amount of cards with this kind of a deck and, and yeah again for just three mana and then yeah you can finish your opponents off in a wide variety of ways as Predation predictions a great way reigns of power is another great one untap all creatures uh you and uh, target opponent control basically i can just kind of summarize this just basically switch control of your creatures with an opponent so sure they get your feldegriff or if you really want to you can bounce it back to your hand if you really want to but you don't have to and then, yeah, gain control of all your opponent's creatures and that hippo army that you gave them too. So, yeah, taking out that same opponent that you made deals with earlier to give them the hippos. Once it's a one-on-one -on -one at the end of the game, no holds barred, right? Take them out with uh, with the hippos that you gave them. So there's a lot of cool, fun things that you can do with that one. And, yeah, that one always seems to surprise people with how it performs. Uh, and then, finally, the final deck that I've got in my uh, my nine deck collection right now that I tend to bring places is, is, uh, is Rarity, actually. And now, that actually, there is a backup commander on this one in case players aren't okay with that, and that would be Quain. But basically, uh, Rarity is a deck that I definitely did not think I would ever uh, keep together. Uh, I played this one initially with the Quest for the Jank Lord crew uh, on their show. So if you haven't seen that episode yet, uh, uh, make sure you check it out. Uh, it's a really fun one. But yeah, Rarity uh, basically it says Rarity Mythic spells you cast cost one less to cast. And that's actually the only part that I utilize on this card. So essentially, the, the restriction I gave myself for this deck is that every single card in the deck outside the lands has to be rare or mythic. It needs to be reduced by rarity's uh, effect, essentially. So that is somewhat problematic over the... Well, it used to be more problematic than it is now, uh, but uh, with mana rocks, because a lot of the best mana rocks are not rare or mythic, at least when it comes to ones that are budget-friendly. Yeah, and actually, yeah, the deck is, in, is again, all budget-friendly. You know, all my cards, essentially, I think at the time were 79 cents or less for the Jank Lord episode, and uh, while I've added cards into the deck, I may have added... Uh, it's been a while. Um, added in a mana rock or two that, that is still less than a dollar. But above that 79 cents so sorry quest for jank lord crew but yeah i mean using mana rocks like cultivators ca caravan uh yeah because i just need mana rocks i need to be able to ramp with this deck but again i can't utilize any of the common or uncommon mana rocks you know like an arcane signet i can't utilize you know any of the diamond cycle i can't utilize uh you know azorius signet or anything like that so yeah having these uh, three mana mana rocks that do get reduced by rarity uh, that can tap for one though and that can just provide you know utility different ways is nice and again more have more rare budget friendly mana rocks like this have been printed lately so it's been helping but yeah this kind of a deck just can utilize a lot of off the wall kind of rares and mythics that i just want to slot in that you know are again budget friendly and don't really have a spot in certain other decks really but i can just do some pretty fun things with them I and mean, one of my favorites is definitely curse of echoes this card is, is in my opinion hilarious uh, enchant player whenever enchanted player casts in or sorcery spell each other player may copy that spell and choose arts for the copy so basically yeah you just throw that on a player and uh, chaos kind of ensues for that player anytime they cast something that's in sorcery everyone else gets value out of that and and yeah i mean them trying to i, I really like to put this on blue mages because <laughs> if they're trying to counter my things it's like oh okay uh, try to counter my spell um, well, uh, I get a copy of that counter spell. And as long as I can convince those other two players to not ca counter my counter spell, uh, yeah, you're not countering anything else for the rest of the game, essentially. So yeah, that can be a lot of fun. Um, Aeon Engine, just another crazy off the wall card that you can just throw in a deck like this. Cause again, it's just focusing on rares and mythics. Just do some big, crazy things for fun. There are of course ways to win in the deck as well. But yeah, Aeon Engine's a fun one to just throw out because you never see it in games of commander. At least I haven't. Uh, and just battlefield tapped, tap, exile it, uh, and reverse the game's order. So yeah, uh, your turn order you know gets reversed. This actually has kind of just led to like a game ending move in some scenarios where a player, the player after me is assuming that they're gonna get the next turn and that they're gonna be able to finish off the other players and all of a sudden the turn order reverses and then yeah, they're kind of stuck out in the cold. Uh, you know, everyone gets an extra turn essentially except for them. 
and then they are taken out by the rest of the field. And so, yeah, there's some pretty crazy things that can happen with that. But yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the recap of, of uh, the, the nine decks that I play with right now. Uh, again, there are definitely going to be some uh, some changes in the future. I mean, Prismatic Bridge deck with the uh, Inkter and Nephilim might get you know, taken out at some point. I do like to have kind of, you know, a, let's say a higher tier level deck uh, just in case, you know, everyone's trying to trying to punch up and do a do uh you know a quicker you know faster um you know uh, more aggressive kind of game but uh but yeah i mean it just depends so we'll have to see but yeah i hope you enjoyed kind of my breakdown of my decks uh and yeah uh let me know what your thoughts are again on these kinds of episodes these kind of uncut episodes let me know your thoughts on my decks are uh what kind of decks do you like to play so yeah let me know in the comments below and i probably should mention this earlier but uh the mustache uh, let me know what your thoughts are on this because this is for november and a competition with some friends so i'm trying to win right now so let me know your thoughts on how awesome my mustache is <laughs> and of course as always thanks again and have a good one this show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you if you're looking for an easy way to help support this show make sure that you like share and subscribe also hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes you can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com we also have a ton of brand new t-shirt designs in stock, so make sure you check out those as well. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support.